Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. I uh, uh, want to thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate your time, and I hope everyone is staying uh, safe and healthy during these times. Uh, my name is Dan Cornell. I'm the Value Added Product Sales Manager for Aggregate Industries in the Mountain Region in Denver. Uh, today, we're going to talk about self consolidating concrete and introduce you to our advanced SCC mix called AlgaFlow. Uh, understanding the technical aspects and the placement do's and don'ts of self-consolidating concrete will, um, we know, will give your company a competitive advantage uh, because you'll have better control over your labor costs and in some cases uh, you'll greatly reduce your, your labor costs significantly. Um, you can also position your company for more technical projects by providing a solution uh, that maybe your, your, your competition cannot. Uh, but we want you to know that uh, our team and your local sales rep representative is here to help you and guide you through the process. Um, a bit of housekeeping today, uh, down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. Uh, we'd like if you would ask questions if you want during the presentation. Go ahead and type those presentation, or click on the, the uh, Q&A button and type your question in and we'll answer those questions at the end of the presentation today. Um, we want everybody to know that the, your microphones are muted uh, to avoid a lot of background noise that we tend to get in these things. Um, and no webcams are turned on either except for just us, the, pres the uh, presenters for this. Um, I want to introduce you right now to uh, our speaker for today, uh, JP Theory. Uh, JP is, uh, U.S. Ready-Mix Performance Director uh, for Lafarge Wilson. Uh, he's been with the company in this uh, country for four years, and he oversees performance across the company's Ready-Mix footprint uh, across the country. Uh, JP has spent much of his career in the concrete industry and has spent over a decade in concrete research and development. Some, re some of his uh, research uh, has included uh, fire resistance of ultra high performance concrete, um, fiber in concrete, shrinkage control, and modulus of elasticity and shrinkage. Uh, good morning, JP. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Uh, good morning, all, and thanks for attending today's webinar. <clears throat> so let's jump right into it. The, the last couple of months have been, uh, if not the last uh, quarter, uh, has been pretty challenging. Uh, and, and is also leading uh, to uh, more challenges to come. And, and we thought it would, it would be a good idea to uh, look at, you know, what we could do to uh, help you cope up with uh, some of these challenges. Uh, and, and, and for us, the first one is obviously um, covering up the backlog that you may have accumulated over the past month. Uh, so it, it's all around doing more with less, so to speak, uh, requiring less people and being able to complete more jobs with the same amount of people, um, but also doing it more safely. Uh, less people on a job site means uh, less probability for injuries and also it, it helps maintain the distance between workers, which is a challenge for uh, all of us uh, these days. Um, now, Doing, having the ability to uh, work faster, complete jobs faster, uh, does not have to be at the detriment of uh, quality. You don't want to end up with claims um, at the, uh, after the job and repair work that will be expensive and also uh, owners not being satisfied with the work. So this is where Agile Flow comes into play. Um, so Agile Flow is a range of self-compacting concrete and really the, uh, the overarching goal of the brand is to find the right balance between fluidity and stability. So basically having a concrete that flows without segregating. It's, it's designed for ease of placement, of course, uh, but also making sure that it will consolidate efficiently around the reinforcement and uh, on the formwork in, in case you want to uh, give some patterns and we'll see more of it uh, later on. Highly flowable, uh, pumpable obviously to end up with uh, a good uh, finish. It's really a wrench. It goes from foundations uh, up to vertical elements uh, and flat work. So it's, it's really covers 
um, most of the applications that uh, we, come, we, we come across in the construction industry. What makes a difference? Because at the end of the day, uh, self-compacting concrete has been around for probably three decades at least, uh, if we look at Northern Europe or Japan. Um, and Agile Flow has been first commercially launched um, a bit more than 20 years ago now, in 1997 uh, in France. So what's, what's really uh, the difference between conventional and Agile Flow? If we look at conventional, uh, kind of, you know, the, the, the easy way to design a self-compacting mix is to take a regular concrete, jack up the uh, admixture content, so uh, really use leverage chemical to increase the fluidity. Uh, and if need be, uh, add a little bit of extra water uh, to get the fluidity a little bit further. Uh, generally, that comes with uh, some significant drawbacks, and you have an example here where you have basically paste going further away than aggregates. So that's a good sign of segregation. And a concrete that segregates would definitely not give you the, the performance that you expect. So generally the solution that's used is to cure the disease that we've created. We'll add some uh, viscosity modifiers into the mix to compensate and control segregation. Main drawback of viscosity modifiers is that the, the flow test that you see here becomes way less sensitive to water additions. And at the job site, the only control that you have to accept or reject a truck is basically the, the slump or the flow test. Uh, if it's way off or if you see segregation, you would know that uh, probably extra water has, going, has gone in there and I don't want to take a risk with regards to strength later on, so I'd better reject the truck rather than pour concrete. Uh, reducing the sensitivity to water addition, you won't be able to see that anymore. So that's, that's potentially a risk, accepting trucks that should not be accepted. So that's the main reason why we really design a dry flow from the ground up for self-compaction. And it starts with specific mix design principles. So it's not just relying on chemicals to increase fluidity and then adding, adding uh, viscosity modifying agents that will lead to a self-compaction. Self it's really designing the entire mix from the binders up to the granular skeleton and then selecting the chemicals. So it's, it's really mix design principles, raw material selection, uh, and there's a tight process uh, around it. And obviously production control is, you know, doing something at, at the lab in a small mixer, that's always easy but doing it every day uh, in production, that's a different story and you need to have clear processes in place. So with a, you know, let's look at it uh, in action and we'll start with an example with a vertical application. Um, so we, we used uh, a transparent formwork in this case because that's allowing us to better see what's happening. Um, light reinforcement in this wall and you see that we're pouring concrete from one side and concrete is just flowing by itself on the other side, completely embedding reinforcement uh, throughout the formwork. And that's really what uh, Agile Flow is, is, is about. That's really the ability to fill up a formwork without uh, the need for vibration uh, and embedding the reinforcement and having the ability to deal with heavy reinforcement if need be. If we look at flat work, um, you've got an example here, a pretty uh, large surface area outside. There's nothing intended to show, you know, how it should be done, but that illustrates, you know, the number of people that you need to place uh, concrete for such a surface area. It was one guy to unload and the same guy is able to level the concrete at the end with a bar and go system that we'll see uh, more on later. So that gives you an indication of you know, the amount of labor that you need for a given surface. I mentioned it launched uh, a long time ago um, uh, in France. Uh, so we thought we would give you a few case studies, but rather than looking at, you know, uh, plenty of countries, we'll focus on the, on the US and recent ones. The first one is really dealing with, with architectural, um, an architectural application. Um, that's uh, a building in Washington, D.C. And as you can see on the picture, uh, the owner wanted to achieve a pattern on the formwork. 
So that's, that was the first challenge, how to properly uh, replicate the pattern that uh, the owner wanted. Um, and he also wanted obviously a high quality of finish because concrete was the final finish in this case. The other challenge was the height of the lifts. Um, and that's a good example here because the specification was pretty clear. 6,000 PSI, slum concrete, all was set in stone. Um, but the owner was really putting the quality of finish uh, uh, as a high uh, factor for his decision making. So he wanted to have a mock-up anyway. So what we did is we said, okay, we'll, we'll do a mock-up with the concrete that's specified, but why not test the dry flow as well? Uh, at the same time, and then compare both. Um, and at the end of the day, it was a no-brainer when we uh, stripped the formwork on, on both mockups. Um, the finish was far superior with Agile Flow, uh, and the owner then changed his spec to move to uh, Agile Flow. So that's a good example of an arch architectural application. Um, completely different one. Um, well, kind of, it's a mix. Uh, we're, we're now in uh, New Orleans uh, with uh, the extension of the airport that has recently been commissioned. Um, columns had to be uh, uh, poured, uh, but with here as well, a, a, a quality of finish requirement um, from the contractor. So it was both, it was both heavy reinforcements, pretty much high strength because it was 8,000 PSI, and high quality finish, uh, basically to avoid patching after the fact. So here again, uh, we went with uh, a dry flow uh, and we've been able to uh, save probably 50% of the time according to the contractor because he had to do no patching at the end and also uh, save some time while pouring the columns because you don't have to wonder where to put vibration, etc. You don't need any. So that, that was way easier to put in place as well. Here we're moving to to purely structural a purely structural application. One the one Dalton building in Boston, um, you can't miss it. That's the highest in the city now. Um, so here, really the key thing was the timeline. Uh, the contractor, because of the location of the job in, in a pretty busy area and, and narrow area, uh, there was a huge time constraint uh, to finish the building. So we had to uh, be able to cope up with that pace. And because of the height, there was a requirement on the modulus of elasticity, as well as the compressive strength. And uh, the core wall, for example, was up to 12,000 PSI. So you combine really high strength with a 60-story building, uh, where you would have to pump concrete from the bottom and suddenly it becomes really challenging, especially delivering downtown Boston. So here again, uh, moving to Agile Flow allowed us to uh, manage the schedule as well as ensure that concrete was pumped uh, smoothly up to the top while reaching 12,000 PSI and the required uh, modulus of elasticity. Last one, uh, kind of a different application here, um, precast uh, piles, uh, and that was again in DC. Um, the objective here uh, for the contractor, so he, he had to um, uh, produce uh, these precast piles up front, but obviously, uh, you know, having to spend a lot of time patching was not really time efficient for, for him. So again here, moving to Agile Flow, uh, we saved 50% of the time uh, completing these uh, precast piles because no patching was required. So you're not looking here at an extremely good finish, but you're able to get the finish that you need without having to uh, do anything else. So that saved a lot of time for the contractor in this case. Let's move on to uh, some keys for success, as we call it, or it's more, you know, kind of giving you an introduction to the, to the difference, some of the differences and some of the common points between dry flow and conventional concrete. We'll start with vertical first. You've seen it in the video. This concrete is really flowing on its own. So if you have, you know, if, if you want to keep something in mind, it really acts like water in your formwork, which means that you can easily imagine that 
if the formwork is not tight, you would have leakage. Uh, and leakage will at best give you honeycombing, which is not the, uh, the intent because that requires patching after the fact. Or it can even lead to a, a catastrophic failure because you have basically a heavy liquid uh, falling through, uh, through cracks. So that can even open your formwork. Uh, so tightness is obviously critical. Uh, cleanliness, same thing, critical. You're filling up the formwork with water, so any dust, etc., will basically uh, go inside the concrete and, and stick to the surface as well. So you don't want that to happen. Uh, so that, these, these are the, two, the first two differences with uh, conventional concrete. Uh, the second one is again related to its nature. Um, it's fluid, so you might have to uh, adjust the pouring sequence. We'll see that a little bit later. Uh, and you're filling it with water, so the pressure that you have applied on the bottom of your formwork will be higher than a conventional slum concrete. So uh, let's dive a little bit more into uh, pressure. Uh, and that's a really high level view here. The, uh, the intent is to give you the uh, high estimates Again, act like, acts uh, like water. So it's basically density of the material times the height will give you the, uh, the, the pressure that you apply at the bottom of the formwork. For lifts up to 10 feet, generally the, the formwork systems that are available commercially are designed to sustain uh, self-compacting concrete. Higher lifts uh, though, you might have to uh, check with the formwork supplier uh, the pressure that the system is able to sustain, and then validate that this is uh, matching with the maximum pressure that you might get with uh, a self-compacting concrete. So that's a high value here. It's this very basic equation. We've got way more sophisticated models uh, to fine tune, but that's a good way to trigger the discussion with the formwork supplier. And if you recall the example, the case study um, for United Therapeutic uh, in DC, that's a discussion we had really early in the process because the lifts were about 30 feet. Uh, so we initiated that discussion with the contractor and the formwork supplier right at the beginning uh, to make sure that everything was in place to sustain the pressure. Pouring sequence. Um, so I would say the first difference that I'd like to notice here is it's fluid and there is no need for vibration, which means that if you have concrete falling from the top, you would entrap air. There's no reason not to entrap air, but you don't have vibration. So the vibration is not here to help you release this entrap air. So that will generate uh, defects at the surface because you, you're not applying any vibration. So you have to limit the free fall if you want the utmost uh, finish on your surface. Uh, and a rule of thumb is generally between 1.5 to three feet, uh, is a good rule of thumb for the free fall. Second, concrete is flowing, fair enough, but it won't flow for uh, 100 yards. What you will get at 100 yards is definitely not what you expect. So you have to position your pouring point, your concreting shaft, to ensure that you don't have more than 23 feet each side. Uh, and this does not mean 46 feet one direction. So that's really 23 feet each side to ensure that the concrete is homogeneous between uh, pouring points. And finally, um, imagine you have doors, windows, so basically openings uh, in, uh, in your wall. Uh, you, would have to, you would have to adjust the, the pouring sequence to avoid free falls, because if you fill all this side up, then the concrete will flow here and fall right from the top here. So you would have entrap air and all that stuff here, which is not what you want. So you would, you would pour it in layers to avoid the free fall and make sure that it evenly spreads uh, around the openings. So that might be a slight difference with, uh, a difference with uh, conventional concrete. Enough of vertical, uh, let's go to flat work. And here, I mean, for me, the most important point is that at the end of the day, concrete for flat work, the ACR recommendation that we see for hot weather concreting, curing, jointing, uh, remain the same. Uh, if you want to achieve the right performance, these recommendations still apply, be it conventional or agile flow. 
So this means that you have to take care of fixed points. Uh, you have to take care of high ev evaporation rates. Uh, curing will be critical and joints would have to be cut on time and at the right depth. Nothing different here. What's different is uh, how you finish it. And, and you've seen it quick, briefly in, in the video earlier. Um, the consolidation is done with a bar uh, and you have a picture here and some uh, drawings uh, that you would uh, apply twice in perpendicular direction. And this is what will give you a flat surface at the end. So that's, that's an easier process than using a vibrating screen, uh, eventually vibrating needles. Uh, that's, that's just a simple system and that's why we call it bar and go. One difference, uh, especially for flat work, is we tend to put cables and plumbing um, at the bottom of, uh, of the slab or the formwork. Um, no big deal with uh, conventional concrete because you know, concrete stays in place, so you, you don't have any issue with that. Uh, but with agile flow or self-compacting in general, these cables or, or plumbing would, would have the tendency to come up if they are not properly uh, tied to the surface. Main reason being that concrete is flowing. So instead of putting like uh, six inches in one shot, you're just putting a very thin layer and then you're adding on top, right? Because concrete is flowing. So that gives the opportunity for uh, these cables to come up. And you don't want obviously to see cables at the surface. So it's important to make sure that they are properly tied. If that's an elevated floor, um, same recommendation as for vertical. You have to make sure that the, the formwork is sealed, otherwise you will have leakage uh, at the bottom of the formwork, which again, at best, will give you uh, honeycomb bait. Last but not least, power trolling. Uh, generally not recommended. First, because the, the timeline will be way longer than with conventional concrete. Uh, and on top of it, it will have the tendency to push the aggregates really far down uh, and not give you the uh, the expected results uh, with power trolling. So uh, the, the first recommendation is to stick with bar and go. That's what will give you the flatness uh, and uh, a fairly smooth finish to put carpet or tiles directly on top of it after the fact. So that's a small difference here. All these aspects uh, will be covered in uh, details um, in two documents that you will receive in a follow-up email. Uh, you will see a lot of pictures, way more technical details. You will see some examples of concreting shafts that you could eventually uh, leave in place. Same thing for flat work. You will have a, a lot of detail in, uh, in a specific document. Um, so that, that will allow you to go into way more details. We, we just wanted to cover uh, the highlights here. And of course, you've got my email here, so uh, you can drop me an email whenever needed if you have any questions uh, to follow up. Thanks for uh, coming today and I think we can now move to the Q&A. Thanks, JP. Uh, I don't see any Q&A coming in yet, but uh, I can get started with just a few uh, that might be floating out there that just aren't being asked. Um, somebody might want to know what is the cost? So, um, <laughs> Yeah, we know this question, right? So um, obviously um, it's, I won't say it's less expensive because that's, that's not the case, right? Uh, but uh, I would say two things. First, it's hard to give a cost because you've seen that we cover a wide range of application. So uh, if, if you look at, for example, one Dalton, uh, the incremental cost is almost negligible in this case uh, because we're already looking at 12,000 PSI. So that's a rich mix, et cetera. If you're looking at uh, foundation, there are ways to also uh, mitigate kind of the uh, incremental cost, uh, but really depends on your application and the requirement that you have. Uh, for instance, uh, high quality finish like uh, for United Therapeutic, um, that leads to more expensive mixes for sure. But if you want the same finish with conventional concrete, that will be a more expensive mix as well compared to the regular one. So yes, it's slightly more expensive, but really the, the, what's key here, and I, and, and, and I hope we touched uh, on it uh, with these uh, case studies, is really to look at the in-place cost. Uh, the objective here is to help you complete your jobs faster 
with less people and not having to come back and patch, et cetera. Um, so that's really the entire cost that we look at uh, and we help you save some time and same, save some after, after uh, cost that you have uh, with conventional solutions. And that's really where our goal is to make sure that you're saving money on the overall job that you have to complete so that the in-place cost is lower with Agile Flow. Excellent, thank you. Um, what about, uh, so if I'm, a, if I'm a flat worker or if I'm a, a wall contractor, how do I know what slum to order for the next? So uh, you, you've, uh, you've seen the, the videos and the pictures. Um, here, you won't really look at a slump because you will use, so you will use the exact same tools. You will use the, uh, the slump cone to measure the, the workability of the concrete and estimate it. Uh, the difference is that instead of measuring the, the difference in height, you will measure the flow, the spread. So you will measure the diameter of the disc. Um, so you have to make sure you've got a plate uh, flat, um, laying flat to measure it. Um, and then you will measure the, the, the flow. So the flow will typically be around 28 to 30 inches. Um, it can be slightly lower than this, down to 25. And generally we don't push it above 31, 32. Sounds good. And then, um, so conventional concrete compared to agile flow, would you say there's any differences in terms of safety precautions we would have to use? Um, so, I mean, with regards to uh, PPEs that you need to protect yourself against concrete, no, no difference. Uh, it's still, uh, it, it's, it's using the same basic components, so the same uh, recommendation apply. Um, really the benefit here is that you, you, you will put less people at risk, especially if you look at uh, these vertical applications or structural applications with columns, with core walls. Uh, the fact that you can get rid of vibration means that you don't need anybody to stand on the formwork, which, which is always working at height, right? So there are ways to mitigate the risk, but still it's working at height. So uh, not having anybody uh, standing on top of the formwork reduces the number of people that we have working at height. And as such is obviously improving or reducing the probability for accidents and improving safety overall on the job site. Very good. Now, if I'm a contractor that, that does driveways, can you use this mix on a driveway? Huh. So driveway, um, this is where, th this is probably the, um, the main limitation of this product, it flows. So, and, and you remember what I said for vertical, really think of it as water. And, and, I, and I think it, it, the same applies for, to some extent for horizontal, so for flat work, um, because if you look at your glass of water, you tilt it and the water will always be horizontal. That's the same here. Uh, having a slope or giving a slope to a jive flow is really, really challenging if, if possible. Um, so wherever you need a slope, it's probably not the right product for it because you would heavily struggle. And for driveways specifically, where you tend to have pretty steep slopes, you, won't, you just won't be able to achieve it. So uh, I would not use that for driveways. Sounds good. Well, I still don't see any questions coming in, but uh, I want to say thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, if you do have questions, I hope you reach out to your local sales rep. I'm sure we can help you get what you need there. Um, again, thanks for your time and, and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um.